Great to see all of you guys here tonight. Some of you I know, some of you I don't, and I'm interested in getting to know you. Um, Cocktails Over Fashion is an event that I created with, with sorry, the main objective of inspiring, informing, and challenging creative minds, more specifically African creative minds. Uh, I feel like we need to collaborate more uh, here in Ghana and here, I mean, on all the continent. And instead of putting each other down, instead of focusing on negative criticism, why don't we try to uplift each other by sharing our stories and owning our stories as well. So without further ado, please welcome the amazing Molly Keog, who's one of my friends and co-founder of Osejuro. You're looking at me like... <laughs> and co-founder of Osejuro, uh, an ethical fashion brand... All made in Ghana. Whoop, whoop. So, um, Molly, thank you very much for being here tonight. You're welcome. Um, please, tell us a little bit about yourself. Shoe size? What do you want to know? <laughs> um, like, where did you grow up? Where did you grow up? Okay. <laughs> I am an American. I grew up in the United States on the West Coast. Um, yeah, I was born in Alaska. It's a very exotic place, very different from Ghana. <laughs> and slowly made my way south and then took a hard left turn and <laughs> found myself in Ghana. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Um, I know that you studied African studies. Yes. I mean, you took African studies at Indiana University. Yes. So how did your, um, how did your relationship with fashion begin? Um, I come from several generations of seamstresses. I, I think I learned how to use a sewing machine when I was like six years old. Before that, I was hand sewing. So it feels like something I've always done and I've always been around. Um, and I remember a point in high school where it was like, you need to choose a focus. And it was kind of like, you know, you're 17 and you're like, what do I like? Um, so I started... Becoming more actively, you know, interested in it, I would say, in high school. And then I have an undergraduate degree in fashion from uh, an art school in the Bay Area. So I studied fashion, but in an art school context. Um, and then I was working... There isn't really much of an industry in yeah. San Francisco. So I kind of was like... What am I doing with this degree? I was working at a fabric store. Um, and then someone offered me work in Los Angeles as a costumer. So I moved to L.A. to take that job. And I did that for five years before we started Oseduro. And I continued to do it for the first at least five years of Oseduro. So for about 10 years, I was working in commercials and movies and music videos and editorial shoots. Um, yeah, so it's kind of a, a meandering path, I would say. Yeah. And so what brought you to Ghana? And, and I mean, how did Oseduro begin? And why the name Oseduro as well? Okay. So these are probably... These are probably the two most common questions that we get, and I always feel like I should come up with like an elaborate lie, but I guess the truth is fine. Um, <laughs> I just answer it. You can so, do it. Okay. Um, so Marianne and I, who is my business partner, there are yeah. two of us. Osedro is two people, fundamentally, and we met in high school, and we were both these like fashion nerds together. We would skip school to go to... like talks at the library about corsetry like it was a really <laughs> dorky thing to be into like it wasn't cool fashion yeah. we're like total nerds about it um so we were friends in high school and then we kind of lost touch and then we reconnected uh drunkenly on a rooftop at our That's the best way yeah as one does at our 10-year high school reunion and marianne was like listen I went to Ghana, fabric is incredible, let's talk. Yeah. And she had come here to visit a friend, um, and she had, after we had 
been nerds together. She had gone and also studied fashion and had her own clothing line. So we really came at it from different sides yeah. of the same industry. Um, so we talked for about a year. I was kind of looking for something else to do. It really just kind of happened. I think it was like a serendipitous timing thing. And we, you know, obviously it was this totally nuts plan to go somewhere that we had very little connection to and try and start a project. At that time, we were just like, this is a project. We don't know what it is. So we were very kind of like, this is an experiment. It could go a lot of different directions. But it's exciting enough to both of us to go and see what comes of it. Yeah. Um, so we first came here together in 2009. So this is our 10 years anniversary this year. Um, Woohoo! And we kind of fumbled around for a couple of years and made some really ugly clothes. And for some reason, people bought them. And there was always just kind of like enough, enough momentum to keep going. And for years, we would both do other jobs. We would do Oseduro, then we would go and make money, and then we would keep doing this thing that was exciting and interesting and challenging, and we didn't know what we were doing. And so we kind of stayed sucked into it, but it didn't pay us anything um yeah and then slowly it grew and slowly we kind of figured out what it was and what was working and we got a little bit of interest from bigger buyers and that helped us to grow and kind of forced us to grow and i mean i would say it's still an experiment like it's still constantly changing yeah that's part of your motto right like as in it's yeah and i think part of that is we're working living and working in a place that we're not from and so it feels appropriate that I don't have all that like I shouldn't have all the answer you know I'm 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 never going to be fully from this place and so I need to continue to grow and adapt and change and just kind of respond to things that I don't totally know Um, and and yeah your your brand is really an experiment because um, I mean I know uh, I did uh, obviously. I know m- I've done my research, but also because I've been buying Osejuru forever. But it applies West African techniques to contemporary designs, and uh, you have developed the use of West African batik on fabrics on fabrics, sorry, like silk and rayon. What inspired you to 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 do that in the first place? Like to to sort of experiment in that manner with African West African techniques. Well. And had you any knowledge of that? Like, had you studied that prior to coming to Ghana? I was definitely, like, in- excited about, um, like, textile aesthetics from this part of the world prior to coming. Yeah. That was something that I researched a little bit and already knew that I loved. And there, I mean, Ghana alone, there's so many. There's hand wovens, there's wax prints. There's indigo dyeing, there's batik, there's tie and dye, there's all these different traditions that overlap and have different histories. And so when we first, you know, there's this like heavily starched shedda with embroidery, there's so many textiles happening here. So when we first came, we were really just like everything, yeah. you know. And I think it's design, right? So you're facing all these real problems. It's not fine art. It's, it, it's grounded in like real physical objects. And also it needs to function as a business. So really on a practical level, you know, we, we got excited about wax print. We were using wax print. But as Anna can tell you, it's a real pain in the butt when you go and buy a piece of wax print that you love in the market and make samples. And then six months later, you want to produce... You know, you're like, now I need 200 yards of this or 600 yards of this, and it's gone. It's no longer in the system. And you're like, well, I kind of sold it to a bunch of people, and I need to find it. And I've, like, chased fabrics to Togo and Cote d'Ivoire and Kumasi, and at a certain point, we're like, okay, we need more control of the production of the fabric. And Batik was that for us. It was something that we could, like guarantee that we would have basically um and most batik here is done on sometimes on shedda although that's harder and harder to find because shedda has become more expensive but mostly on what what we refer to as ghana cotton like this real basic plain weave cotton that lasts forever and you can wash it a million times um 
but and especially more and more it's it's becoming quite coarse it doesn't feel like a luxury fabric and for the amount of work that goes into our garment we felt like it made sense for it to be a fabric that really felt good um and so the, a real turning point for us was when we decided to bring in fabrics. So instead of only buying fabrics in Ghana, we started importing rayon, importing silk. And, oh, wow. and that really meant that we had to find batikers who were willing to, to change their recipes. Because silk is a protein fiber. It responds differently to the dyes than the cotton does. And even the rayon, it's like sensitive in different ways. So... The sh- a big shift for us was bringing those fabrics, and it also meant by changing these existing methods, we had to find people who were interested yeah. in, in yeah. those shifts, I guess. Yeah. Um, we're going to get into something a little bit sensitive right now, or I mean, not sensitive, but a little but important. Oh, thank God for that. <laughs> so, the term ethical fashion. Um, I feel like these days it's kind of used more as a trend, more than an actuality. So I would like to know how your specific brand is ethical and why is that important to you or why, yeah, why is that important to you? I would agree. I think like, I don't know. I mean, it's a hard one because like, yes, it's good that, you know, H&M is talking about being green. But when you produce, like, millions of units yeah. a year, how, no matter how organic it is, how can that possibly be environmentally sustainable? Mm-hmm. So I think it's, it's really complicated um, what, what that word means. And there's all these different parts of the supply chain and parts of the way you run your business and even parts of the way you photograph your clothing like do you use a wide variety of models you know there's all these different faces to the industry that can be thought about ethically or not um and for us primarily because of limited resources the things that have felt good and important and possible to focus on have been transparency in the work that we do So who do I work with and how much do I pay them and what does the work look like and here are photographs of the workspace and really trying to be open about um, kind of like our supply chain. And you talked about like openness and collaboration in this environment, which I I also agree. I think sometimes um, designers can be kind of jealous with resources. And obviously there's a need to protect what you're yeah. doing, but I think within reason, I, as much as I possibly can, I try and like actually share those resources. Yeah. Um, the piece that has been missing for us that we are now finally in a position to focus on, which is exciting, is the fabric. Because we, like, we do the dyeing ourselves, we do the sewing ourselves, we do all our administrative and QC stuff, but we buy this fabric from people who we've never met and yeah. it's produced in places we've never been. So we are we are finally now in a position where we can think about buying sustainable, or whether that means organic or whether that means recycled. I, yeah. you know, that's, that's kind of like the missing piece of the puzzle for yeah. us that we're excited to. So 2020 hopefully will be a lot of kind of like fabric research. Yeah, I, I, I know that Osejiro believes that you know, economic and environmental sustainability are intrinsically linked. Uh, I know that you aim to support, I'm looking at my paper as well because I want to say it's right, but like I know you aim to support local textile industries on both large and and small scales. And you you source most of your material, if not all of your material in Ghana? We source the hand-woven fabric, the linen, the cotton. Sometimes we can find denim here. Um, whatever we can find yeah. here, we buy here. But the yeah. rayon and the silk we bring in. Um, do, you th- do you think that other African brands have a responsibility to, to be ethical? And do you think that they should follow this path? That um, they, like that it's, yeah. That no, they it's a good question. I went to something recently and this guy was like, he kind of broken down in a great way. He was like, sustainable means it can be sustained. 
Like, it means you can keep doing it. Yeah. If you want to keep doing this, you have to be sustainable, yeah. like on a most basic level. If you're using too many resources, like the end is in sight, and yeah. we can all see that. So I think anyone who's concerned about any kind of a long game beyond their personal, you know, life, <laughs> I don't know if I would say they have a responsibility, but like it. It seems obvious to me that these are things that we all get to think about for our own sake, if not for everyone else's. Like, if you want to sustain yeah. what you're doing, you have to do it sustainably. It's like a Absolutely. basic equation. We, we live on a finite planet with finite resources. Yeah. But do you think that there should be more um, African brands that are ethical? You know what I mean? Like that... that that brand themselves as ethical fashion. I think that would be great. I mean, I think there's a lot of, I don't know, I hear a lot of stuff about, like, African luxury, which I actually, yeah. like, have a real bone to pick with because I don't feel like it really, I don't, I don't see the benefit of, of being, like, proudly producing, you know, $6,000 handbags. Like, the, I don't... I don't know. I don't, I, I've never been that excited about luxury fashion. I, yeah. It seems kind of boring to me, but I also feel like that it doesn't feel like the future. It feels like an imitation of a past that's a little bit pointless now. Mm -hmm. And I don't know. I've always been more interested in the fringe and like what are what are new ideas? And that doesn't feel like a new idea to me. And this yeah. part of what's exciting to me about being here is like Ghana specifically feels to me like a place that has all this information about how other places have chosen to do things mm -hmm. and this industry specifically is is young enough partially I mean it used to be stronger and it's been run down a bit but this industry is in an interesting position where we get to make really informed choices about like directions to go in and so to me it, it just feels that is what feels most exciting and I, sure. I wouldn't guilt somebody into joining the bandwagon but yeah. I just you know they're making a wrong I choice totally, I, I, I agree with you on, on some <laughs> level Ooh, we have a question I, I knew this was gonna <laughs> stir people up but I mean I'm just gonna give my opinion though I, I do think that there is power in doing what would be considered African luxury, like luxury African fashion. I'm not, I, I also agree with you. I'm not like for the whole blowing it all the way up, but I do feel like there is some power in African brands, sort of like, why can't we call ourselves luxury brands? Why does it have to be Chanel and Fendi? Why can't it be, you know, Christy but Brown, for example, who I had last, 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 last month, you know? Yeah. Who, who, who actually, you know... But Chanel like, and Fendi just sell perfume and handbags. Like, that's not interesting fashion. Yeah. That's like... There's nothing... They're not doing anything new. Like, it's like... Yeah. Like, why would you want to jump on that old dead bandwagon? Yeah. To but me. I don't, but, I, I, but I do... Okay, so... What I do think... Like, placing value on oneself and being like... Yes. Our shit is great. That's, and that's it's, what it I'm, can stand next to exactly. this stuff. Totally agree. Yeah. Like, if, if what you're making is worth a luxury price, by all means, charge that price. Yeah. I just, I guess for me, the term is loaded with this, yeah. like, very kind of crass, commercial, I don't know, celebrity riddled, like, thing that Nothing I... Nothing wrong with celebrities. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> Um, I mean, nuances of what you're saying, we will understand. But to me, it, everything has its own politics. So, so I'm trying to understand what you meant. Is it from a very personal point of view and yes. taste? Personally, because right now you are kind of a you know you you are talking about something and something in a space where um, you know other people are also are also like 
you know, creating in. So is it from a very, is it just personally or you think, because she, uh, I feel like her question was asking you what you think when it comes to that from a viewpoint of somebody who has a brand that has been in the forefront of actually like innovating technique and things that have been from here in that sense. So, you know, do you feel that way and it's just personal or you think that is a stance that should be a thing for everybody? I'm really interested in money and like where money goes and how money is calculated and how value is calculated. And I think we are situated in a place where the conversation about value and cloth is super rich. Like there is a history in this place where we are of fabric being money, right? Fabric used to be a currency here and it still is in many ways. So when we talk about luxury and value, we're talking about what the thing is worth, right? And if you break it down on a Chanel handbag, the, the, the labor and the parts and, and the design efforts that went into that bag do not equal the price tag, right? At least probably 75% of the price of the bag is the name. And that to me is like utterly boring. It's, it, I don't, I don't, like what, I, what I, and, and I think it's unethical. Like, for me, part of being an ethical fashion brand is looking at how the money breaks down. Does everyone who works here get paid enough money to not stress about the potential of having to go to a hospital? You know, are they, do they know they're going to get paid on time? Great. And how much are we spending on shipping? And then how much do I then need to charge someone? Like for you, an American, uh, to design in Ghana, um, have you... Have you gotten any backlash for that because i mean your brand is made in ghana but like you know maybe some people might be like you're not Ghanaian, so you know or you're not african so you can't technically do that or whatever you know you have people that have different opinions about seeing you behind ose duro so can you tell us a little bit about that if you've had any backlash or any resentment coming from people a lot of times people are like but where is he like, where is Osedro? Because they're expecting a Ghanaian man. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yes, for sure. It's weird. <laughs> like, I, I don't know. I, I, I think that's... How do you deal with that? Like, I mean, if somebody came to you and felt offended that you are, you know, designing in Ghana and making clothes in Ghana and then selling them in the states. Yeah, how it's a how do you how do you deal with that? Extractive potentially, exploitive. I mean, those yeah. are the concerns. Yeah. Right? You're just here because it's a cheap place to produce. Yeah. Um, which I can assure you it is not a cheap place to produce. Like Los Angeles is a, is the same price. I could have stayed in LA and produced clothing and not spent a lot of money at DHL. If you could give uh, advice to young aspiring designers, what would it be? Let's keep it short. Like, let three three pieces of advice. Okay. Yeah. Um, fashion designers specifically. Yeah. Or oh, creatives, or actually, actually, overall creatives. Like, um, I think one thing that. Okay, sorry, I'm keeping it short. No, no, there are other roles besides designer. Like this, what, what I think what the Ghanaian industry needs is excellent technicians. We need pattern graders. If you want to learn pattern grading and figure out how to get a machine here, you will have more work than you can do. We need production managers. We need sourcers. Like there are, the design job is not actually that sexy, and there are all these other technical jobs that they require great skill and creative thinking that we absolutely need. Like design is not the only role. Yeah. So I, my first thing that I say to everybody is do your research about what all the possible roles are. Someone recently was like, I have a background in tech and I want to move into fashion design. Great. There's so much tech work that needs to be done in fashion. Like there are all these other positions that are super crucial and you can make them interesting. So that would be the first one. Um, 
Yeah, I guess the second one would be it's just like it's really not that glamorous. Like you're going to work your butt off. If you're going to be good, you're going to work. Even if you're going to be mediocre, you're going to like work your butt off. So hard, hard work. Um, But I don't know, three things. Then at the same time, like you have to also love it. Like you you have to do figure out what makes you happy so you can survive. Like that's another piece of sustainability, right? Like it. If it's if you're burning out, you can't sustain. So figure out what makes you happy, and because as you grow, you suddenly realize that I spend my whole day replying to emails. Like it's so hard for me to find time to actually design. Um, so be I think be really conscious about like which part of this business do I want to spend my time doing, and let me hire people to do the other parts, not the part that I actually want to do. Thank you, Molly. Yeah. I want to thank everybody for coming tonight and uh, thank you for sharing and thank you for participating in this conversation. I'm gonna go to the